Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Fred and Lou Hartwig family, Peter and Barbara Gattermeyer, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize, and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight from the left, the right, and the center over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly. In addition to roast and toast, our topics this week, the Chiefs head to Miami, the Lee Summit School Board heads to St. Louis to find a new superintendent, and Jackson County goes to City Hall to find a new administrator. And that's where we start with our Newsmaker segment and talk about issues in Jackson County government. With the chair of the county legislature and joining us now is Teresa Cass Galvin, who represents the 6th District and is in the second year of her second term. She was elected to serve as chair in 2019. Teresa Galvin, thanks for joining us. Congratulations on your new job as chair of the Jackson County Legislature, and let's talk about what's going on. Thank and you. there's Thank a lot to talk me. about. There, there's a lot going on. I guess the biggest controversy in Jackson County government, and there are several, mm -hmm. is the battle over property tax levels and the sense that maybe most people were taxed at too high a rate. There are lawsuits that are going on, various people looking at the situation. You're right there in the center of it. What's the status of these tax issues and the tax debate? Well, last year, um, the legislature, we passed an ordinance stating that there would have to be physical inspections for anything that was increased or any properties that were increased more than 15 percent. That means you have to physically go to the property. There is no And look drug. at it and see if it's really exactly. worth the Exactly. Go the knock increase. on the door and right. say, I'm here. You know, can you help me? And Let that me take wasn't some done. That was not done this, this past reassessment. However, that will not take into effect until the next, you know, reassessment period that well, goes on. what about on. these people who got the large bills and say they can't pay for them? Weren't they supposed to pay the taxes by the first of the year? Taxes were due December 31st. Um, are people paying them? People are paying them. Some are paying under protest. Uh, some are still going through the appeal process. And if you have an appeal, I believe you don't have to pay them and that they will, you'll get a letter stating, you know, what your new tax bill is to be and you have 30 days from the point of the tax bill to pay it. So obviously something has to be done about the property tax situation in Jackson County. Is Absolutely. that fair to say? Absolutely. All right. Whose responsibility is it? I know there are three court cases at least, three mm -hmm. lawsuits that have been filed. Uh, is it the court's obligation? Is it the Jackson County Legislature's position to get something done, or is it the state legislature? So it's at the state level. The Actually, the assessor, she reports to the county executive, so the legislature has no control over how the assessment is done or any, anything like that except for passing that ordinance. So I know the state does have some legislation going through this year that they are looking at capping. Um, different variations and you know again the physical inspections is something they're bringing up also they're also bringing up whether or not the assessor is to be elected Jackson County and St. Louis County are the only two counties in Missouri that have an appointed assessor as opposed to an elected assessor uh, another huge issue in Jackson County is the jail and that's mm -hmm. not new that's gone right. on for at least several decades I think what's being done about that are there plans to build a new jail I know it's costly Absolutely, and it is costly. We're looking at probably $200 million, so this isn't something that we're going to do overnight. Um, we formed a working group, and the stakeholders in the working group were myself, the county executive, and the sheriff. We, on December 16th of last year, December 9th, I'm sorry, of last year, the legislature approved a contract with JCDC, an organization, to work as an owner's rep. And they have started their first step as far as going through and looking through, you know, all the reports that we had had done over the past few years. They're looking at those reports and they're coming up with their, you know, report of their own with their information. And they'll be addressing the legislature on the 27th to give us an update of what's going on. Sounds like you're several steps away from a new jail. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This, it'll be a four-year project. It'll be four years before we have a jail. At I, I think you played a key role in the hiring of the former city manager, Troy Schulte, to become the new county administrator at Jackson County. County. And I think it's a wise decision, by the way. Uh, I know he's only been on the job a short time, but do you think he's getting a bit of a handle on what's going on and, and starting to see some ways to solve these 
tremendous problems? I think he is. I, you know, of course, with any new position, there's there's a learning period. Even though he he was right across the street and he does know all of our issues that are going on. You know, now being actually being in the trenches, he's been great to to bridge a gap. I mean, he's someone that's great to con talk to. I can call him with anything that comes up, and he'll. He'll make a phone call. He'll do what he can to help if he can help. How is your relationship with the county executive, Frank White? You've had some battles, have you not? Uh, the legislature has had some battles. Uh, the prior legislature had a different relationship with him than the current legislature does. I would say that Frank and I have a good relationship as far as if he has an issue or hears some rumors or gossip, or if I hear rumors or gossip, we'll pick up the phone and call each other and say, hey, this is true or what's going on. There's some distrust between the administration as a whole and the legislature as a whole, and I think in time, you know, maybe that'll all pass. Speaking of time, ours has ended, but it's been a pleasure meeting you and uh, good to talk with you. Come back and see us another time. I will. Thank you for having me. Thank you. That is Teresa Cass Galvin. She is chair of the Jackson County Legislature. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Annie Presley is an author, publisher, and GOP fundraiser. John Stevens is president and CEO of Port KC. Jason Grill is founder of J Grill Media, a public affairs, strategic communications, and media relations consulting firm. Jason Grill approved this introduction. <laughs> and Ron okay. Freeman is a motivational speaker and writer. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Good to have you with us. Mike. Good to be back yeah, with all of you. Mike. Let us begin where we left off, talking about the myriad of issues facing Jackson Countyans and the folks who represent them in the county legislature. We tried to cover a lot of territory with Ms. Galvin and her work as chair of the county legislature. Let's start with this. Annie, you watched the interview. What's your overall reaction? What's your impression of what Teresa Galvin had to say? She's smart and she knows what's going on. But I'm, I'm having a hard time believing that she's going to be able to overcome this distracted leadership that we've been suffering for so long in Jackson County. So she has her hands full, but there was nothing that she said that was particularly surprising. John, uh, anything that uh, stood out to you during the conversation? Yeah, I think the mention of uh, Troy Schulte. Uh, stepping in. I think that's an important piece of professional management, staff management. I think that's going to give a little bit of a buffer between, I think, some of the contentious uh, relationships between some of the elected officials and, and maybe put a little more process into some of what I think sometimes has been maybe emotional reactions, knee-jerk reactions to things. Uh, it kind of hopefully puts a little buffer in there. I was talking with her a little bit before the interview and, and we were talking about Troy Schulte and I think the thing about a professional administrator is he can grasp the size of a problem and realize it can be solved. Otherwise, people look at it and say, there's nothing we can do. It can't be resolved. Administrators learn how to resolve these issues. Absolutely. Uh, and, and I think Troy particularly, with his experience in KCMO and just his overall experience. I mean, he's had big problems there. He's had big problems. <laughs> and I, I think one of the advantages that Troy brings to this position in Jackson County is he knows how to break big problems into digestible pieces and, and advance things in a, in, a, in a way where, you know, a $200 million jail could easily be a $300 million jail. Uh, and, and you're going to have to take time. And likely and, will be. And likely will be. <laughs> right. and, and you're going to have to plan and work hard to do it in the right way uh, because that's a generational decision. So, Jason, do you think the public's lost confidence in Jackson County? Uh, uh, probably a little bit. Uh, but I think what John was talking about is probably going to restore it. Um, I think most of the public uh, likes Frank White as, a, as mm -hmm. a human being, as a person, as a legend in Kansas City. Um, that's been my experience with him, too. Absolutely. So uh, I, I think the Troy Schulte hire was was perfect at this time and place, and I think that'll help restore some trust, I think, back to the I, I to wonder the if he'll have trouble getting people to back him in the county, simply because he's new and he came in at a high salary and with a strong reputation. You know, I don't know about that, but I think that... Uh, He's going to command the immediate respect mm -hmm. of a lot of most of the folks, especially those that are have worked in government for a while because of his experience. Ron, some of the people we've talked with on Ruckus over the past several weeks have suggested that the whole concept of Jackson County government ought to be reviewed, maybe changed completely. What do you think? Well, I think we need to grow up a little bit. It's too easy to point the finger and say it's the executive fault. It's the legislature's fault. Let's just come together and make good decisions. I think, again, Troy Schulte provides an opportunity, excuse me, <clears throat> and the leadership to get that done. But do we have the maturity in the legislature to make it happen? 
County jail has been discussed for as long as I've been in Kansas City, and that's been a few years. Do you get any sense from my discussion with Teresa Galvin that there may be some resolution to that issue in the relatively near term? It's getting higher on the priority list, which is a good thing. And um, a $200 million jail sounds small compared to a billion dollar airport that we're t dealing with. So maybe we're to the point where four or five times the number of prisoners in a single jail is a breaking point, and maybe we're there. John, what was your sense of this whole battle about property taxes and what Ms. Galvin had to say? <laughs> well, uh, obviously, rightfully, people are upset. Um, but I think, and, and what I'm going to say may not be popular with a lot of people, but I think historically Jackson County property values have been under-assessed. I, I think on purpose. A, a, and, I mean, that was part of a plan. And, and, and the assessments have been inconsistent. And I think this was a large increase for a lot of people, and rightfully people are upset. That being said, hopefully in the next cycle, things can settle out. I do think that, that commercial, industrial real estate, things like that probably need to increase. I think neighborhoods need to be looked at more thoughtfully, more consistently. But the reality is taxing jurisdictions and a lot of these things need real assessments in, in real collections in, a, in a, a right priced way if we're going to afford things such as a jail and services. And Ron, our guest suggested that this property tax problem should be resolved by the state legislature. Do you have confidence that will be done? Well, I think it, <laughs> who's, whose fault is it, right? Who, who's going to take care of it? I do think that you get to look at it and say, we woke up the populace, right? Right. Everybody, been happening yeah. for a long people time. are aware yeah. now and they're looking at their uh, assessments more carefully and they're going to raise questions and I think we'll have an answer before. And I think that's a good well, thing. Yeah, I think it's a good, good thing, thing that the public's engaged in the yeah. process. What a concept, public paying attention <laughs> to its government. All right, for the Lee's Summit School Board, the buck stops there. Dr. David Buck from near St. Louis is the new superintendent following weeks of controversy over equity training. Former Superintendent Dennis Carpenter, an African-American, left the district with a three-quarters of a million dollar settlement after protracted battles over diversity issues. Dr. Buck is not a minority, comes from a district much smaller than Lee Summit. Buck was chosen after a national search and won't begin work until July the 1st. So, Ron, I know you follow this closely. Will this appointment end the battle over equity in Lee's Summit, or is it going to continue? Uh, I don't think it will end the, the battle. I think it's a public battle, and a lot of it has to do with, uh, I was at a board meeting last year when the current um, consultant was hired. They asked him if the equity approach that he was going to use would help close the achievement gap, which to me, that's a goal, <clears throat> excuse me, the goal of education. And he said, point blank, he said that it would be disingenuous, and I quote directly, uh, for us to say that our work will close the achievement gap, which is oh. why people said we don't want to use that guy. But after weeks of peppering, you know, you're racist if you don't do this, that they capitulated and gave into it. But no, there's no proof, there's no evidence that it's going to make a difference where, where kids live. Is there equity training in Lee Summit? Uh, I thought there they, is. They, did they go ahead and hire the company? And it, they did go ahead and hire the, the company. And to make it clear, uh, t you know, back to 2016 when the agreement was we're going to look at an equity plan, it's just that this particular approach hasn't yielded the results that we would like to see. What do you think, John? you think uh, this new superintendent, the appointment of someone new to that job is going to end this battle? Well, the little bit I've read of the finalists and of the, of the selected new superintendent comes from a district that's faced a lot of challenges. There's been a lot of, uh, a, a lot of things that he has been able to take head on. He is a, a teacher-focused uh, superintendent. So I think that there's a lot of positives there. Uh, I think he's stepping into a challenging environment, uh, somewhat of a caustic environment. And uh, I really do hope for the students that uh, he can do it and, and kind of bring uh, that, the, that the school board and that the, the families will step, will, will support him in bringing some, uh, a little bit of healing to that community. Annie, educate us. What is equity training? Do you have any idea? Well, the I'm great, sure you do. The but. best example I saw was um, there was a study done of what the teachers were actually teaching and how they were teaching it and how they were communicating with the students. And they would identify times when they could have said something more racially sensitive instead of the way they presented it. So the, the whole idea is, is that you provide 
all of the information, not just some of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jason, who is equity training for? Are we training teachers? Are training we training teachers, students? Training or? teachers, training, uh, training administrators, and I brought this today. I got a letter from the Missouri Bar, Mike, that we're now required as attorneys in Missouri to do one year, or excuse me, one hour of implicit bias, uh, diversity, inclusion, or cultural competency training every year. Mm -hmm. So this is a... This is a thing so you that's can't be just... hostile toward a host of programs. <laughs> <laughs> not but a protected it, but, class. But, but it's not, it's not <laughs> going to be required of attorneys in the state of Missouri to take similar right. trainings. Well, that's good. well it's Ron, it's, shouldn't it's, teachers already thing. have a sense that there are different kinds of students in the classroom? Well, it's well, not I, a new concept that there are racial mixtures in, yeah. in schools. Well, one of the glaring realities is you have African-American students who are valedictorians, who earn scholarships to, excuse me, Harvard, to Stanford. So people are being educated. How is that working? <clears throat> Instead of looking at the, uh, the idea that somehow it's skin color, maybe there's some other factors, and we know this, I mean, in terms of parental involvement, in terms of early childhood education, those things are factors that make it, that's where equity is lost. And when you think about equity in general, it's an economic term. It's, it's a value base that I bring to the table, well, <clears throat> excuse me, you have kids who come to the table where they didn't have lunch or breakfast, where they didn't have two parents at home. No one held them accountable academically. And how do we solve those problems in terms of moving kids forward? And I think that's where the equity piece misses it because it doesn't address those issues. The former Carpenter. superintendent, Mr. Carpenter, maybe Dr. Carpenter, I'm not sure, has remained in Lee Summit, I believe, and formed a consulting company and he feels he's been mistreated. He had a public speaking engagement for, I think, $1,500, and it was canceled. Do yeah, you know that, about that? Uh, that? Yeah, I've heard about that, and that's really <laughs> interesting because last summer I was actually scheduled to speak to a new teacher orientation, and Carpenter himself vetoed my presence. Oh. He saw you on television. <laughs> he, yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, oh, wait a minute, dude, wow. you did that very... Hmm. How do you make that case? But you know what? We play in an environment where he, I guess he feels like he can get away with it. Can equity training, its success or failure, be measured? And if so, how? Th that's a tough one. But I do think that, that equity training and bias training, both implicit bias training and, and unconscious bias training, both racial, uh, uh, ethnic, se you know, sexual orientation, other things, those are important. I mean, they're, they're valuable for educators and the public and, and business leaders and everyone to have continual knowledge and presence of understanding of how we treat yes. people respectfully. Well, we're going to see this kind of training not just in schools, but in, as you suggest, businesses. We, we have it in our organization. We, we've implemented it and we continue to implement it. I think it's a valuable thing for, for gender, racial, social equity and understanding of each other. There is nothing wrong with understanding people better. Annie, yeah. you agree with all that? It, the implicit bias is probably the most... Now, what's the distinction? What's implicit bias versus, versus it's when, explicit bias? Whatever you know as an individual, you apply to others you're with, and, and sometimes it's offensive to others, and you don't know it, and you don't recognize Maybe the Maybe assumptions you make mm -hmm. before speaking. Right. So this is what the teacher example I, I gave. This was the problem that she had. She was teaching. She was popular. But she didn't realize that she was veering off onto an area that mm -hmm. others found offensive. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a pretty tricky. It is. It's a sticky it wicket, yeah. truthfully. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I took the assessment. I don't have any biases. You guys should know this. <laughs> yeah. well, actually, I, did. I took yeah. the Harvard... The Harvard uh, mm -hmm. By in uh, whatever implicit bias assessment, yeah. I'm good. So you guys need to listen to me. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. All and, and you need to listen to me because I'm going to be reading from the teleprompter. Okay. <laughs> it took five decades, half a century, for the Kansas City Chiefs to win a second trip to the Super Bowl. But it happened last Sunday when the Chiefs took the AFC Championship, ending the season of the Tennessee Titans. Now, Ruckus is hardly a sports discussion program. <laughs> But it's hard not to talk about what the Chiefs' success means to the team and to the region. And difficult as it may be for younger panelists to believe, some of us were actually around <laughs> when the Chiefs made their first Super Bowl appearance in 1970. For those of you who were not, Jason, how does it feel? <laughs> very close, Mike. Uh, feels very good, actually. Uh, I think it's a huge thing for Kansas City. It's a huge thing for... Uh, the team, and it's a huge thing for economic development and, and pride, right? Mm -hmm. Civic pride. I was out of town 
uh, last weekend during the game, and I was in D.C., and there was Chiefs jerseys all over the place, which was really cool to see. Uh, and I was on the way here today, and I was listening to a national show, and they were talking about Patrick Mahomes' brother and his TikTok page. I mean, just all of these different things about the Mahomes, uh, uh, great stuff happening on with Patrick Mahomes, with the city. I mean, it's, it's through the roof, and it just is so many impressions throughout this world that the Chiefs are now uh, doing. Well, so. Will it translate into economic measures? I mean, will more people come to Kansas City because the Chiefs are going I think, to I think it will help with that. I also think it will help local businesses. As someone who owned a, uh, co-founded a sock business in 2014 and 15, it was a very good e-commerce year for us. Yeah. Uh, and local sellers. Sorry you got out, aren't you? you put, oh, yeah. Well, you put, <laughs> crowns, good, good put blue crowns on everything in 2015, <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, yeah, you just avoid the cease and desist works. letters, Mike. That's what it is. I, I did want to explain that asking that question of Jason about being here the last time does not imply, I think, Annie, John, and Ron no, were no. too old to be asked that question. Well, appreciate that. We've Thank been you. worried about Thank that. You. Yeah. How, does this compare to the excitement Kansas Cityans felt when the Royals were on their way to winning the World Series? In well, it certainly does, and there's just so much enthusiasm right now for red, and I love the idea that, that we get all this national attention. They show the photographs downtown, mm -hmm. it's all lit mm -hmm. up, and the people are so excited. And just think about that celebration after the World Series and all those people in blue uh -huh. in the Union Station parking lot. It was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. crazy. So, yeah, it's very encouraging. <clears throat> it's it's very uplifting. And everybody is a Chiefs fan. Everybody. Well, yeah. Yeah. The only thing that's different about it is it's like one or two days, right? Three days of games. Yeah. And then the Royals. And they're not was, hosted here. Yeah, the Royals no. was, was a full couple weeks. I mean, it was just continually in our minds. Is there such a thing that can be called civic pride? Oh, absolutely. Are we I mean, seeing it now? We're wearing it? it. I think we're seeing it. We saw it start. I, I think there was a groundswell before the Royals, 2014, mm -hmm. 2015, <clears throat> magical runs. But they amplify it. You know, in, in economics, there's a, there's a principle called psychic income. And it's, it, it's hard to quantify a lot of times. But there is a psychic income comes with boosterism of people being proud, gaining pride in their city. Uh, and then there's awareness. And for cities like Kansas City, there is a proven benefit to when we're a smaller city, you have this awareness boost factor mm -hmm. that we can't spend the money that New York, Chicago, Las Vegas spends to advertise tourism to our city. We get this, we get this free benefit right. of all these commercials and all the cuts to this, and it does have an impact. It has a real and meaningful impact that hopefully we can take advantage of as a community and we can build on. Unlike the four of you, I have an earplug, mm. and I have communications from Eric Motter, our producer, who hates for me to say something incorrect because then there'll be nasty emails about it. <laughs> so I should point out this is the third trip third. of the Chiefs yes. to yes. the yes. Super Bowl. Yes, yes. true. Second time, second time that I recall, it, but the second time, the, second time the yes. Chiefs are going to win the Super Bowl. So most businesses, many businesses, Benefit from this? Well, there's there's the obviously there's the ones sports, the restaurants, and bars, and yep. you know, places people going out celebrating. But then there's there's the the sales. But then there's also the the secondary benefit of the economic development of businesses taking a little more interest in Kansas City. Uh, there's always cities have proven not cities that host necessarily, but the cities that are participate participate. The next 12 to 18 months, you see a slight uptick in tourism visits. People are like, oh, well, wait a minute, I didn't know about 18th and Vine, or oh, wow, they have. Some pretty neat things there. I'll come yeah. check it out for a weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't just, turn just, television on without, seeing, without the seeing Kansas Chiefs, City and the Chiefs, right? Same, same, same kind of thing right. the 1976 Republican convention did for there, Kansas there City. There is a and clear Walter uptick. Cronkite, who mm -hmm. was familiar with Kansas City, was anchoring for CBS. Absolutely. Uh, final quick question, Annie. How many more commercials will Patrick Mahomes <laughs> be seeing? In? You know, when he first came here, his agent said they were going to just slowly move him into these sponsorships. And I thought, okay, they jumped off the cliff last year because yeah. he's you just see him all the time. He's hosting the Ruckus. Season, though. Yeah. Next season. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 come, it's come to that. He's all guy. right. He's i got to move on. It's model. time now for <laughs> Roast and Toast where the Ruckettes have 30 seconds each to scold, uphold, or fold. Let's begin with Annie. I'm toasting Lamar Hunt and his family yes. today. In 1960, he got an idea on an airplane about as entrepreneurial as you can get to start a new football league. And here we are, this, these so many years later, and all in love with red. And I also want to make a little shout out to our former chief, Ron Freeman. Yeah. Ooh, what a privilege. Awesome. And he brought cookies today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, is it Chief's your birthday cookies. or it's, close? It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's my birthday, Mike. Okay. Happy, happy Two birthday. Two days ago, but it's my yeah. <laughs> Happy belated birthday, uh, Jason. 
Well, I uh, would love to toast the Chiefs too, but we forget about the Royals, right? They're uh, mm -hmm. they're doing a lot of stuff too. They have a new manager, new ownership. But uh, Salvi is a, becoming an American citizen yeah. this uh, week, United States citizen, That's and uh, he's getting doing the paperwork, getting sworn in at Fan Fest. And uh, as a U.S. citizen, I wanted to toast Salvi because these memories of the Chiefs are now bringing back memories of the Royals' 2014-15 run. So, uh, kudos to Salvi. I'd like to toast him on a, uh, being a U.S. citizen. All right, John. Sure, I'd like to give a toast to a local nonprofit called Uncover KC. Uh, they're an organization that connects willing volunteers with local charities that need uh, volunteer and support services. I believe they have uh, uh, brought in 50,000 volunteers and have raised almost two and a half million dollars in impact for 400 local charities. So please check them out. And Rod? I'm gonna toast Patrick Mahomes because he's been the catalyst that kind of took us to that next level and just not just the fact that on the field or off the field, just a good person who treats people humbly, uh, friendly, a very engaging guy and, and proud to call him a Kansas City Chief. Had to do a lot of research to get to that one, didn't you? I did. I did. <laughs> it took me a while. And finally, with the nation facing a budget debt of more than $22 trillion, that's trillion, not billion, it is fascinating to learn how some of the money is being spent. A few examples. $2 million to improve TV programming in Moldova. $1.2 million to study online dating habits. $10 million to promote green growth in Peru. And almost half a million dollars to study the mating calls of frogs in Panama. You know which ones those are? They're wearing the straw hats. <laughs> Did you get that? They, they told me that wouldn't play. And that is Ruckets for this week. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckets and the crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks for watching and good night.